Thank you, Ken, and uh, thanks to the panelists. You know, I think every one of the sessions we're going to see today could go on for a couple of hours. That was really, really good stuff. The next session is our uh, patient panel, and our moderators are Ann O'Donnell from Georgetown University and Greg Tino from University of Pennsylvania. Thanks, and, and good morning, everyone. Um, I've had the good fortune of participating in a number of conferences where physicians and, more importantly, patients are, and I've always found it to be really a very fulfilling experience, and after all, that's why we're all here. Um, so we're fortunate today to be joined by uh, four patients. Uh, we'd like them to come up. Laura Kelly, Mary, Ro Mary Rose Kitlowski, John Torrance, and, and Dr. Janet Zwanziger. So as, as the patients come up, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Laura Kelly, who's an NTM and bronchiectasis patient who has underlying alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Uh, she's a retired sales, marketing, and patient advocate, uh, advocacy professional from Atlanta, Georgia, where she leads the NTM support group. Um, Mary Kitlowski um, actually doesn't have NTM. I think she's okay with me saying that. She has uh, uh, primary ciliary dyskinesia and bronchiectasis and chronic pseudomonas infection. And uh, she's from Maryland. She's the founder of Running on Air, which is an organization that raises awareness about chronic lung diseases, rare diseases, and the need for supplemental oxygen. Uh, one of the ways Mary raises awareness is by running races, and uh, she's currently training for the New York Marathon, and uh, she monitors her oximetry when she runs. <laughs> She's also a model airway clearance patient, so <laughs> more to come on that. Um, and her husband, Ed, carries her batteries when she does the running. Yeah, he'll, he'll be my Sherpa in November. <laughs> and uh, John Torrance uh, was born and raised in, in Southern California, uh, previously lived in Hawaii, and now resides in Las Vegas, Nevada. And John was first diagnosed with, uh, with microbiotarian abscesses back in 2012 and has since been diagnosed with bronchiectasis and actually several other NTM infections. And he and two immediate family members are participating uh, in the natural history study of bronchiectasis uh, at the NIH. So welcome, John. And uh, Dr. Zwanziger is originally from London, but now lives uh, in Newton, Massachusetts, where my son lives. <laughs> um, and uh, for many years, she was very active as a gardener and swimmer before her diagnosis of bronchiectasis and NTM. And until her retirement last year, she is also a psychiatrist who specializes in the care of older adults, especially with depression and memory disorders. Um, and she brings, a, obviously, an important perspective uh, of a patient who's a physician with a significant illness and its challenges. She's married to Ron, who's here today, and they have three children. So welcome to everyone. So maybe Laura could start out by um, giving us a little synopsis of, of things for you. Okay. Um, in 2006, at the age of 47, um, through a random chest x-ray at an annual physical, um, nodules were discovered on my lungs, so um, of course I was terrified that I had lung cancer. Um, but after two CT scans and finally a bronchoscopy, I was diagnosed with um, mycobacterium intracellular. Um, after six months of um, being watched by my physician in Atlanta, not feeling terribly comfortable with his knowledge of this disease. He was a good physician, but it was a rare disease, especially back in 2006. Um, I reached out to, in, on the internet, did some research and reached out to a patient who had a lot of experience with NTM, and she gave me some recommendations, and the one that I followed was to apply to the NIH for their study of NTM at that time. And fortunately, I was accepted, and to this day, I feel very fortunate to be treated by the amazing physicians at um, the NIH. So my first visit in 2007, I ran through three days of testing, and I discovered that my underlying condition is alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, and I am a ZZ homozygote, which for those of you, you know about alpha-1, that's the worst you can be. So um, at that time, I was started, um, since my CT scans had showed progression over that year, uh, I was started on the antibiotics and, um, uh, and tolerated them fine. Um, and I was a fairly asymptomatic um, patient. I wasn't coughing. Um, I was just literally discovered because I had the random chest x-ray. So 
um, started the antib antibiotics, and unfortunately, I think it slowed the progression of the disease, but I still progressed. Could not get a negative culture from the three antibiotics. I was started on clofazamine as well. Um, and what the turning point was for me was that I did the clinical trial for air case in 2013, and I immediately at that time started culturing negative. And um, cultured negative for a couple years, but unfortunately I um, reinfected um, with MAC this time. And um, after observing it for a while, we decided that I needed to go back on the antibiotics, went back on them. And uh, probably six or eight months later, my next sputum cultured showed abscesses. So that, you know, really terrified me. Um, and in November of this year, um, we decided to start the IV therapy. I did the emicase and IV, the emipenin, um, started to desolid. And in January of this year, I've cultured negative. Um, dropped off the amicacin in March and started clofazamine and got, stopped the imipenin. And I've just, as you can tell by my raspy voice, I started Aricase again. So um, that's where I am today. But I've had two negative cultures, so um, try to remain positive that um, it continues to be negative. So that's kind of my story as quickly as possible. Great. Sorry. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mary. Um, so I have a rare lung disease called primary ciliary dyskinesia, and there's only about 2,000 confirmed cases in North America. I was first diagnosed when I was 17 with bronchiectasis by a chest x-ray. So when I was diagnosed then, and I'd had a chronic cough, my parents took me to allergists, and I'd seen an ENT since I was about two. Um, so I had been diagnosed with severe asthma and um, chronic sinusitis. So once uh, they saw the bronchiectasis, started looking to see what had caused that. And I had been ruled out um, in elementary school with CF. Someone did think to at least test for that. Um, so through process of elimination, um, then finally through um, uh, microscopy, I know I'm saying that, not getting the whole thing, micron microscopy or something like that, they were able to tell there was a defect in the cilia, and it's been confirmed also uh, with DNA. Uh, I have one sibling, she also has PCD, and um, five years ago, and it'll be five years in June, she had a double lung transplant and is doing great now. Um, still has some PCD issues because sinus um, has been flaring up more for her with that. Um, so when I started Oxygen in 2014, I decided to um, start running on air. There wasn't any information out there about getting oxygen, and what had happened was my sister um, and I both started at the same time. She called me up, and she was in tears. Her oxygen company had, she, so she was a new mom. She had a three-year-old and a one-year-old at home. She was working part-time. They dropped off her oxygen, and she's a nurse practitioner, and she said to the person, there aren't enough tanks here for me to, um, you know, for me to work this week. And he responded with, well, people on oxygen don't work. And so, uh, being the big sister that I am, <laughs> you know, that was a wrong that needed to be righted. And so, ever since then, I've been trying to, I guess, set the example and just, you know, raise awareness that I do feel like there's a, um, in our culture, it's people on oxygen are almost supposed to be seen and not heard, and maybe not even seen. And I think the way oxygen works these days is it is a decline. Um, oxygen companies don't necessarily give patients what they need to live their normal life. They give them what they need to survive. And for a lot of patients, and this happened to my mother-in-law, uh, she wound up not having enough oxygen when she would go out. She had been very active. She had COPD too. Started to stay home more and declined really quickly. So, you know, th this is, I guess, like part of my mission. And then the one last piece I'll throw out and then I'll be quiet. Um, just, I guess, as a contrast, as an FYI, yes, I'm training for the New York Marathon. And um, thanks to my primary pul pulmonologist, Dr. O'Donnell, 
I have been going through the lung transplant process. And uh, I guess getting a little nervous that uh, I thought this was, oh sure, they can get to know me. This will be several years down the road. I mean, we're still in the process, but it's sounding like it might be sooner rather than later. So that's been an interesting twist. Thank you. John. So, so my story began somewhat similarly um, to Laura's in terms of having a routine um, C coronary artery CT scan three years ago, which showed that my coronary arteries were fine, but I had a little surprise. I had um, bronchiectasis, which at that point was very mild. And they said it might be in the pattern of something called MAC, which even as a geriatric psychiatrist for almost 40 years, I had never heard of. Um, so at that point, I was feeling absolutely fine. Um, my pulmonary function was excellent. I couldn't produce any sputum. Um, and um, I did see an infectious disease specialist. And I'm not quite sure what he told me, but I certainly left with the impression that I might be fine for many years and I should just come back if I was feeling sick. So shrouded in my cloak of denial, I went off for three years, um, finally coming back and getting another CT scan um, last fall, which uh, showed significant progression. It was now in more lobes and more extensive. However, I was still feeling absolutely fine and continue to feel fine from a pulmonary perspective uh, with no cough um, and uh, no systemic symptoms and still excellent um, exercise tolerance. Um, but anyhow, that got me started on my journey through the world of MAC, so I now do have a formal diagnosis of MAC. Um, I had a bronchoscopy, and I managed to produce enough sputum on one occasion that uh, showed I was smear, uh, smear positive. I'm not a productive copper, although I've been doing airway clearance for three months now. And treatment decisions, I think, will probably hinge somewhat on how my next CT scan in August appears. Um, so it's, it's been a kind of roller coaster of a few months. I think I could probably speak a little to being very new to this process and maybe some of the rest of the uh, participants have sort of forgotten some of these early stages, hopefully. Um, but, it, you know, it's been quite, um, it's qu been quite an anxiety-provoking diagnosis. I think even beyond um, the diagnosis of a chronic illness because there are some things that are special about NTM in terms of, um, I think, the the ambiguity about when to start treatment, um, the limitations of treatment in terms of how helpful it is and the, the potential burden that it imposes, um, the different advice that you get from, from different doctors because of the, this ambiguity, and also the ways in which it changes your sense of safety in the environment. Um, I was a carefree swimmer and gardener until six months ago, and now I feel very much more vigilant about my environment. I have cut back on some, uh, cut back on some activities and stopped others, including swimming, which has been a loss. Um, although I have obviously had some other things that have been good in terms of meeting a wonderful community of uh, people who are invested in this illness. Um, so, so I think that there are some things that are striking um, about this as a diagnosis and in terms of the demands of adapting to it. And, uh, I'll stop there. Thank you. John. Good morning. I celebrated my 50th birthday in 2009 by starting to cough. And I spent about two years uh, self-diagnosing, going down the cough aisle at the local drugstore, trying everything. Um, I could tell you the difference every different cough medicine available. I tried environmental changes and I tried diet changes and nothing seemed to work. And finally, I went to see the professionals at Kaiser in 2011. I was living in Hawaii at the time. And the first thing they treated me for, and they, just normal pneumonia, and I went through the normal um, antibiotics and it was only after about the third or fourth visit when I decided I was actually going to get emotional and complain that this wasn't working that we kind of elevated the standard. And we started looking a little more closely at chest x-rays. Uh, they found a nodule on an x-ray and suddenly I was a uh, lung cancer candidate. So that got them all excited. And we went through CAT scans and PET scans and bronchoscopies and AFB sputum tests 
and finally came back with uh, Mycobacterium obsessus. So at that point, I'm transferred to infectious disease, and I got my cocktail of medicines with the PIC line and the IV drugs and the little machine to take home at night and have fun with, uh, the airway clearance and all kinds of things. For me, I started feeling like I was in a science experiment, quite candidly. Um, my, my day consisted of making sure that the medicine and the routines were taken care of, and if I had any time left over, I could go live a little bit of life. So I got through the various times with uh, IV drugs, but it was a serious dedication to treatment to have to do that. Uh, my doctor was highly intelligent, infectious disease doctor at Kaiser, and he says, I think I know what you got, I think I know what the plan is, but I've seen this three times in my entire career, and therefore I'd prefer that you get yourself to a national center um, where they do this every day. So he suggested National Jewish Health, and Dr. Hewitt, who is here today, uh, was my doctor, uh, along with Dr. Mitchell. Uh, they came up with a plan for me in a matter of days, um, and it turned out what I needed was surgery to remove the upper right lobe of my lung because the bronchiectasis was highly concentrated there, and then follow up with more IV drugs. Um, so we proceeded with that immediately. Um, the surgery was done remotely. Uh, recovery was fairly quick. Uh, my neighbor only had to mow the lawn about two weeks uh, after I got back before I could take it over myself. Uh, we went on for about a year. I went through various antibiotics. Finally, I cleared of um, abscesses. One thing I learned, though, was I couldn't wait for doctors to tell me eight minutes at a time what the plan was. I had to do my own research, so I got on the internet and I kept looking around. Uh, somewhere along the line, I realized that the diagnosis they were giving me was very similar to what my mother had, so I checked in with her and she laid out the same plan. She had bronchiectasis, she had MAC. Um, so I started looking for clinical trials and I found Dr. Olivier's trial at NIH where he's looking at family connections. <coughs> and that has been very helpful to me. My mother and I were enrolled as a pair, and they've done genetic testing on us to see you know, what the uh, genetic combinations might be. Um, my mother passed away in 2016, so I thought I was gonna lose my happy place at NIH, and they said, no, I'm still welcome to come. Uh, but luckily, my sister started coughing last year, and... Uh, <laughs> So I said, hey, I got a hot one here. <laughs> so sister and I are a new pair, and we're going to NIH every year. Uh, I keep telling the doctors, I have cousins, I have cousins. <laughs> if I could just get them to admit to their bronchiectasis, we'd be fine. Um, I'm on, I think, my fourth different infection. Every time it's been a different species. Uh, and throw in the Pseudomonas, the Aspergillus, the Staph, all those things. About 15 different antibiotics. That's my story. So I think, um, you know, the, the patients here certainly represent all of you in the audience here with a really kind of spectrum of disease and spectrum of infections and every patient has to realize they, they're their own person with their own uh, set of issues, so the treatment has to be personalized. I wonder if the panel members might comment on how you fit your treatments into your day. Like, do you have any tips for your fellow patients in the audience um, to kind of, um, how, how you do it? How do you do it? Uh, well, one of the things I guess I'm sort of grappling with more lately is trying to fit all of my day into my day. <laughs> and it's been getting harder and harder. Um, so certainly treatments are a priority. And it's the first thing I do. I mean, for me, part of it is just that sense of habit. I get up and I go do my, my treatment first thing. Um, it, yeah, you know, it's just, for, for, for me, it, it's making a habit. So uh, nebulized, um, um, do two nebulized medications, a bronchodilator. Um, I do, because I do have an asthma component, do a steroid. Um, and then um, 
I alternate uh, an an antibiotic, inhaled antibiotics every two weeks. And, you know, for me, airway clearance is throughout the day. Um, you know, I'll take breaks periodically to just, you know, go clear out my lungs. And when I do my NEBS, I um, have one of those, you know, vibrating, you know, vest type things that, that, uh, that we wear. But um, I also have, so, you know, I also just will, you know, pound on myself also as needed. And for a newly diagnosed patient, it's a big change, yes, right? Yes, it's yeah. a big change. And one thing I didn't mention is that I've also been suffering from GERD the last six months, which is obviously a comorbidity. And so it's not only been, a lot of, I wouldn't say that I have a huge burden of stuff to do with the lung disease yet. I am doing airway clearance mm -hmm. and a nebulizer, but, um, but fitting in the right number of meals around that and then stopping eating by seven has been a challenge, and especially in terms of maintaining my weight. So, uh, so that, yeah, so it, it does feel like a lot of the day is taken up with planning and just trying to fit, fit the, the routine in around, you know, around all the other things I still want to do and been able to do. Um, I find it um, really difficult being a support group leader. I hear a lot from uh, many different patients. Um, I'm fortunate that I don't work and so that I can fit it in. Um, but the younger patients that are being diagnosed now that work and have children, I think it's extremely mm -hmm. difficult. Mm -hmm. um, but the key components to me in uh, fighting this disease is diet, exercise, and airway clearance. And you do have to, for me, since I'm not the most disciplined person, is starting out early in the morning, so at least I get the morning part done. By the end of the day, I'm tired. I think, you know, if it's hormones, infection, or what, but I am tired, so it's sometimes difficult to do the evening one um, things. When I was on the IVs, it was uh, two 30-minute IVs. It was, you know, an hour IV, so when, depending on what uh, medications you're doing, it's, it really is not easy to fit it all in. Um, so. I agree with the other speakers, um, and I was reminded by Laura's uh, mention of her raspy voice. I was on air case as well, and I definitely got the raspy voice. Uh, one of the things they mentioned when I started that was give yourself a little reward, a little mental plus, something to say that you've done it. And I thought, especially with the voice issue, I thought ice cream. I'm going to have ice cream. I don't care if I gain 20 pounds. So my roommate and I celebrated. I don't know what he was celebrating about, but I had ice cream every night after the air case. That's great. Uh, Laura, you mentioned that you've been a participant in, in clinical trials. And, and tell us about your experiences and specific challenges that you face as a clinical trial participant. Um, it, I, well, for me, to start culturing negative was a big positive. Um, but it is, I mean, you, to participate in it, and you want to do it for yourself and for the patient community, um, you have to do what they say. I mean, you have to show up at your visits. For me, I had to drive from Atlanta to Birmingham. Um, I had to do all kinds of sputum cultures the day before, the day of, um, pulmonary function tests. Um, but for me, it was, it was worth it. Um, I, I mean, I got free drug, I mean, <laughs> you know, and, um, and I, it also just feeling like I was participating in helping the patient community. So I, I'm a firm believer of, of it. Since I have Alpha-1, I certainly get emails from um, the Alpha-1 registry about, and so I'm constantly, I've done several clinical trials, one, some from Alpha-1 and some for NTM, and I, I think um, I really encourage the people that are in my support group to read them and reach out and participate, because if we don't, we're, we're not going to have these, you know, we finally have one drug that's been approved, so I'm, I'm all for it. Other? Well, my concern is not for me particularly, but especially when I hear that there might be a genetic connection for the nephews and nieces, the grandkids that are out there. If we don't resolve the issue now, we're just passing it along. So since we're already involved in it and already committed for an extra 10 or 15 percent, uh, we can give some information back to society and make it a little bit easier on the next generation. Mary, maybe you might comment, and also about some of the difficulties of getting the drugs, um, insurance, yeah. those yeah. kind of things. I'm sure that's an issue that patients face yep. yeah. uh, frequently. 
Yeah, so for me, on the bronchiectasis side, um, you know, I have been a part of a couple of drug trials, um, Kasten being one of them. And um, Kasten, I thought at first, was, you know, this great miracle drug. I've been exercising, but I kept, like, I couldn't go up to the next level. Um, you know, I was plateaued. And when I started the Kasten trial, um, all of a sudden, I felt like I could breathe more easily, and I was able to work harder in my workouts. Um, so I was very disappointed when um, Kaysen did not do well with bronchiectasis. And now I haven't had an issue getting Kaysen yet, thank goodness. I was a little worried um, that I would. Now, Pulmazyme, on the other hand, um, I was not part of that trial, um, but I, you know, m matter of course, you know, it's always denied. And there was a period there where I appealed and was able to, to get it. And for me, I felt it was helpful. Um, you know, maybe that's because I do do the extra airway clearance, but, you know, it just, you know, for, for me, I felt like it helped. Um, you know, and one of my frustration with a lot of the bronchiectasis drug trials is that they've been failing. And, you know, I think, you know, maybe more you know, I'm not sure what research is being done, but, you know, looking at, you know, not all bronchiectasis patients are exactly the same. You know, we have different disease groups and how does that affect things? You know, my disease group ha having a genetic component, um, you know, CFers are taken out and they're their own bronchiectasis CF group. So, you know, what are those differences and how are they impacting the studies? Um, so just, you know, for the, door, for the Pulmazyme one, people might think um, that um, PCD wouldn't really do well with it because we don't have the cilia to bring that loose mucus up and out. So, you know, I know there weren't a lot of PCDers in that study, but if there had been, maybe the PCDers were, were the ones that tanked it <laughs> for, for the rest. So, you know, I think those things don't really get looked at with a, with a lot of these studies. So we have uh, just a couple minutes left, um, and, and maybe you can each leave us with a couple of seconds about a message that you'd like to impart to your patient, fellow patients, or to the providers and physicians that are out there. Janet, why don't we start with you? Um, well, I'll, I'll take it from the physician point of view, because um, I came to this from, from running an Alzheimer's clinic and often um, you know, which had some similarities in certain ways in that you were telling people a diagnosis of a severe illness with, without a good outcome. And one of the things that was really helpful was um, we were fortunate to have um, a non-medical uh, team member who was able to coach patients and families significantly. And one thing I have seen that's really hard for, for myself and some of the other people I know who are at the early stages of this is um, just getting the right information and getting, getting started on doing certain <coughs> things like airway clearance. There's a lot of very confusing information out there. Um, people are not always given clear instructions at the time of their appointment. And then I think probably a lot of people fall by the wayside um, in terms of following through on treatment. And I, I think um, probably, you know, building in a more of a coaching element, maybe through a team member, or maybe patient-to-patient pa patient, uh, peer coaching. Obviously, support groups do play a great role in this kind of thing, <coughs> too. Um, but also more clear written <coughs> instructions that really reflect what was said in the appointment and that then get translated into a prescription and, and <coughs> to, to you know, f facilitating people getting started on, on things like uh, getting a nebulizer and, and the correct... Um, mm -hmm the correct uh, saline, for example. It can, it can be a problem. Okay. Thank you. Mary? Um, so for me, I would encourage, um, to the best of your ability, is exercising. Um, you know, you don't have to be crazy like me and do a marathon. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think any type of movement that, you know, we're able to do, and, you know, I get that it's not easy, you know, it's harder to breathe. And, you know, maybe I have a little bit of advantage because I've been, you know, decline, my lungs have been declining over, you know, a 50 year period, as opposed to, you know, for many of you, it's happened, you know, later in life. Um, 
but you know, I, I just think that's one of the best things with you know, your medical, your medicine regimens um, that you can do to help keep yourself healthy. John? Do not depend on a local physician for a diagnosis. <laughs> Get to a national center. <laughs> Get a diagnosis from someone who specializes in this. Get a treatment plan and stay in touch. Even if your local physician is following the treatment plan, get the treatment plan from one of the large national centers. Um, when you go to a doctor appointment, you study ahead of time. You get all the information you can. You bring written questions to the doctor. You bring your spouse, your life partner, your best friend with you to take notes during the appointment because the information passes so quickly you will not remember all of it. Um, and I think being an informed patient is the best way to go. Thank you. Um, there's so many things. Um, I think keeping a positive attitude, which is sometimes difficult when you don't feel good. Um, but like what um, I think Mary said, um, exercise I think is critical because I think it makes you feel good emotionally and physically and it's good for our lungs. Diet, I'm a huge advocate of um, either uh, keeping your weight in check, whether it's overweight or underweight, do it through diet, supplements, I believe in supplements. Um, uh, find a support group, uh, research on the internet, ask questions, don't be afraid when you go to your doctor, you require that they give you the results, don't take a no, because it is your results and I think you should co keep copies of it. Anytime you go anywhere, have your own copies. I've, gone, I've got on an airplane, gone to see a physician, and the, 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 my records weren't there. So be really careful about having that with you. And like John said, write down your questions. Um, write them. Bring a recorder, because sometimes you can't write fast enough. <laughs> um, and uh, keep a good spirit. Go to, like they said, go to the um, institutions that treat a lot of patients. And I thank all the previous patients that are here or not here who've given me incredible advice. So thanks. Great, thank you very much. Thanks so much yeah, to the panel.